Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together to be in your house, Lord. This is an important message, Lord, and I know you laid it on my heart, Lord. Give me the ability to deliver it. Lord, I'm feeble and weak, Lord, but you are strong. I can only do this through your, through your will, Lord. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we begin reading in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind Halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the waters. Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the waters, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. On the same day was the Sabbath. So there was an impotent man. He had no hope. He laid there for 38 years. He had no hope in himself because he couldn't make it to the pool on his own. He had no, pool, no hope in the pool because the pool couldn't come to him. He had no hope in man because man could not put him in the pool or would not put him in the pool. He had no hope in an angel because the angel troubled the waters. The angel wouldn't put him in the pool. He had no hope whatsoever, but we read at the very moment he found hope. And his hope was Jesus Christ. This would make an excellent salvation message, but it doesn't stop at salvation. But this applies to anything and everything as pertaining Christian life. There is no hope in anything apart from Christ. There is no hope in prayer apart from Christ. There is no hope in being a fruitful Christian apart from Christ. There is no hope for the church apart from Christ. There is no hope in anything apart from Christ. So my first point is hopeless in fruit. The title of this message is Hopeless Without Christ. First point I want to make is we are hopeless in our fruit for the Lord without Christ. Let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. That is the goal of every Christian in the whole wide world, is to want to be fruitful. We want to be fruitful in our walk with the Lord. We want to win others to the Lord. We want to be a blessing and win others to Christ. You cannot do this if you're not walking in fellowship with Christ. If you're not reading your Bible every day, if you're not reading your Word and letting God speak to you, if you're not praying, you're not talking to God and God's Word's not talking to you. And so you cannot lose your salvation. Don't misunderstand me. You cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose your fellowship in that meaning you're not talking to God like you ought to in prayer. You're not letting God's Word speak to you. And so that communication is being broken. And whenever you are out into the world witnessing to somebody, the world knows whenever you have not been in your, in your Bible. It's like blood and water in a shark's tank. A Christian that is not prayed up and studied up is like a man swimming in a shark tank with a cut. The world has been lost a whole lot longer than you have been saved. I don't care if you've been saved for 50 years. The world has been lost a whole lot longer than you've been saved. And whenever you try to witness to somebody and you're not reading your word, if you're not reading the word of God, the world's going to know it. And they will pick you apart and you will be totally ineffective in your witness. You cannot be a fruitful Christian unless you are prayed up and studied up. The world has been lost a whole lot longer than you have been saved. Abide in Christ. If your walk with the Lord is weak, the world and the devil will know and you are well on your path to a path of defeat. A fruitful life of the believer involves a love for God and true love for His Word. Regular answer to prayers and a holy life. A joyful spirit. Inner peace and contentment with the will of God. Growth in grace and concern and compassion for others. You have a sacrificial attitude. You're dependable. You're stable. And you want to win converts. That is a fruitful life. And if you're not dis displaying those fruits, you need to have a closer walk with the Lord. There is no fruit apart from Christ. Abide in Christ. There is no hope in prayer apart from Christ. Let's continue reading in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Let's go back a chapter to chapter 14, verse 13. John chapter 14, verse 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He didn't say ask anything in a saint's name, did he? He didn't say, ask anything in Mary's name, did he? No. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. 1 Timothy 2, 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You cannot pray to anyone else other than Jesus Christ. A prayer to a dead saint, a prayer to Mary cannot go past the ceiling. It cannot go past the ceiling. And yet there are churches that teach that you can pray to a dead relative. You can pray to, to Mary. You can pray for a saint. But that is unbiblical. They have no biblical basis for what they teach. 
lots of times, you, you know, in, in Old South, lots of times it, you talk to an older relative and they say, well, I spoke to your, you, you ever know somebody that says that they think that they can talk to a dead relative? That is going against what the Word of God says. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9. Deuteronomy 18 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his sons or daughters to pass through the fire, or that useth divinations, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. The word of God does not pull any punches. It calls that an abomination. And there are churches that call themselves Christians that practice this. And the word of God calls it an abomination. This preacher that you're looking at did not call it an abomination. The word of God calls it an abomination. The word of God is an authority higher than any man could ever be. The word of God is higher than any pope. The word of God is higher than any bishop. Whenever the word of God calls it an abomination, it's an abomination. Familiar spirits is dealing with the deceased. Whenever someone prays to the deceased, the word of God calls it an abomination. Any saint that has ever gone on to be with the Lord, I promise you does not want your prayers. They would rather you worship God instead. There's hopeless in life apart from Christ. Let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There is no hope in life apart from Christ. This does not mean personal prosperity. This means that He is our peace whenever there is no peace. He is our joy whenever there is no joy. Christianity is the only faith that offers hope at a graveside. Amen. He is our hope. He is our joy. He is our song whenever there is no song that this world could sing. Whenever this world says, you ought to be miserable, we have peace. Amen. Whenever the world looks at us and says, you ought to have no joy, He is our joy. Whenever the world says you have no hope, and you're nothing but a cosmic accident. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our joy. We can smile through the storm. We could put one foot in front of the other because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord offers a victorious life whenever the world is walking in failure. There is hope in life because of Christ. But apart from Christ, there is no hope. He gives everlasting life. Everything that you look at today is temporal. Everything you see is here today and gone tomorrow. Temporary. 
everything that Christ has to give is eternal. It's forever. He gives us eternal life, everlasting life. What a thing. What a joy. The pains that we experience, even the pains we experience are temporary. But the life He gives is eternal. And you know what's so sad today is lots of times if you go home and start talking to people, where does the conversation go? To temporary things. I'm originally from Alabama, and if you shake a tree in Alabama, four or five Baptist preachers will fall out. And I have sat at the table with preachers and talked with them and I try to keep the conversation on the Lord, talk about biblical things, and lots of times the conversation will stray to football. It'll stray off to baseball. Well, how's this going and how's that going in your life? What a shame. We're talking about things that's temporary whenever the greatest name given among men is just like, well, let's get off of that for a minute. Let's talk about something important. What a thing. Let me tell you something. Whenever you find yourself in the hospital, it ain't going to be a ball game you cry out to. Whenever you find yourself in a prison cell, it ain't going to be a ball game you cry out to. Whenever you find yourself down on life and considering suicide, it ain't going to be a ball game you cry out to. Whenever you realize you are a hell-bound sinner, it ain't going to be a ball game you cry out to, and it ain't going to be your favorite athlete either. And it's a shame that even preachers, of all people, don't even want to talk about the Lord whenever they're not in church. Maybe some of you don't like talking about the Lord apart from church. Let me tell you something. He is all that matters at the end of the day. He is all that matters. Anything or anybody is all temporary. He is all that matters at the end of the day. There is no hope in life apart from Christ. There is no hope for the church apart from Christ. Go to Mark chapter 16. while we're talking about <clears throat> where conversations go. Let's go to Mark 16, verse 15. And he saith unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is the gospel? Moreover, brethren, we're in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? Gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus Christ gave the church the charge to preach the gospel. And the majority of, I would say, a large percentage of the churches today are nothing more than country clubs with a steeple on it. Because they have ignored the charge to preach the gospel. There is no hope for the church apart from Christ. And that should be the message that is, should be at the tip of our tongue to any individual. Not, and I get it. There are messages to preach as far as Christian growth. 
But if somebody walks down to this altar and says, I want to get saved, what are we going to tell them? Jesus died for you. And He was buried and He rose from the grave. And if you will trust Him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, He will save you right where you stand. That should be the message that we give to any individual who is seeking salvation. That should be the message that we should preach to the world. And there are lots of ways to give the gospel. I personally like to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. A lot of people like to go to Romans Road. Romans Road spells out death, burial, resurrection. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Verse 8. But God commandeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's His death. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, He shed His blood for us, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. That is His resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. Romans Road spells that out plainly too. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Verse 9. A lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people skip the message of death, burial, and resurrection and they just say, well, just hold my hand and repeat this prayer. That's shallow. Just hold my hand and just say this prayer and you'll be all right. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt do what? Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead... Thou shalt be saved. So it's not wrong to call on the Lord, but that foreknowledge of the gospel has to be there. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then, well let's read this next verse though. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How, the, how shall they believe on Him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except He be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the what? Gospel of peace and bring in glad tidings of good things. That question at the end, how shall they believe except... So let me go back to the verse. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? That should be the message of the church. But a lot of churches today are not spelling out the gospel. They're not doing that. Unfortunately today... There are a lot of churches that are nothing more than fire insurance salesmen. All they are is fire insurance salesmen. And it's a sad tragedy in America today. There's a church on every street corner. Why is this country going in the direction that it's going? Because they're not preaching the gospel. And that is where I will put my foot down and I will put my foot in the sand and I will take my stand. I will not compromise on the gospel. And you shouldn't either. And any church that does so is not a church. It's a gate to hell. It's a gate to hell. And any preacher that does not preach the gospel is a hireling. And I sometimes think these people know they're going to hell and they're just trying to sell as much fire insurance as they can so that they can lead as many people to hell with them because misery loves company. Misery loves company. Call on the Lord. That's good. As long as you understand the gospel is presented. And it's so easy for a child to understand. This time to the date almost last year, 
we were in church in North Alabama. This was before we moved down here. I had the joy of seeing a young five-year-old boy come to the altar, and the preacher asked him, Son, do you know you're a sinner? He said, Yes, sir. Do you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins? He said, Yes, sir. Do you know that he rose from the grave? Yes, sir. Are you willing to trust him as your Savior? Yes, sir. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. So easy a, co a child can understand it. Why do we have to water it down? Why? Why? It's so easy for a child to understand. So simple. Why water it down? My last point is there is a hopeless soul apart from Christ. A hopeless soul apart from Christ. Let's go back to John chapter 5. We're going to glue it all together. John chapter 5 verse 1. We'll read it once more. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. That's the world today. Waiting. They're blind, they're impotent. That, with, that impotent man was laying in his own filth for 38 years. And that's every lost person. That was me before I got saved. I was laying in my own filth. My righteousness is filthy rags. For an angel went down at, the, at a certain season in the pool and troubled the waters. Whosoever then... First, after the troubling of the waters, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been a, now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man, uh, the man immediately was made whole and took up his bed and walked on the same day was the Sabbath. The man had no hope in a pool. The man had no hope in himself. The man had no hope in others. The man found hope, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you found hope today? Amen. Have you found hope? Jesus died for you, and he was buried, and he rose from the grave on the third day. He shed his blood for you, and that blood has the power to wash all your sins away. And if you believe on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, he'll save you forever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to preach. and Thank you for this, this time we have to study your word. I pray that if there's one here that walked through these doors unsaved, I pray that today they can get saved today. Maybe they, I pray, Lord, that if somebody has got something else on a pedestal, I pray that they could put you on that pedestal today. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Heads bowed, all eyes closed. Maybe you're in here today and you've never been saved. I invite you to come and trust Christ as your Savior today. Maybe you're in here today and you know you're saved. You know you're saved and you know you're going to heaven, but you have found peace in something else and you've put somebody or something else on a pedestal and it's stealing your joy away. Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Where's your joy today? Where's your peace today? If it's coming from anywhere else, I invite you to bring it to the altar and lay it here and walk away with Christ in your heart. Why don't you come today and get it right with the Lord?